Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode four, episode quattro of Jordan and Drew, the sports crew, the summer sports spectacular. I'm Jordan Lorenz, and if you're new and you haven't been here before, you won't know my voice and you won't know the voice of the man who does a podcast with me each and every week. Drew Skyberg, how you doing on our Wednesday morning? I'm doing great. I'm looking forward to an excellent Super Bowl game that we're going to be watching today. Are you... um? Uh, being a little sarcastic with the excellent. Uh yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it, Jordan. But the first half, you know, not not exciting. But we'll, we'll we'll get into that. No, it was a high school football game we watched. I think we can both decide on that. But as Drew said, we watched Super Bowl Seven. So I didn't realize Super Bowl Seven is from 1973. I didn't realize it was this far back. And when you're watching the game, it doesn't seem that far back. I mean, we watched the. Oh boy, what did we watch? The 91 World Series? And that yep. felt older. That felt older than this. Do you agree or not really? Yeah, I feel like it looked older. I mean, both of them didn't have the scoreboard or the timer or the clock, I guess, let's say, on on the screen. And it, they just, I don't know, the 73 one, for being in 73, they showed us some excellent replays. They gave us some good angles, something we didn't even see 18 years later in the 1991 World Series. Yeah, maybe it was football was just that far ahead of baseball or something. I don't really know, but. Like you said, I was going to mention it later, but let's talk about it real quick. The scoreboard issue. We just are going to have to get used to it because in all of these old games we watch, there is no scoreboard. And they put the clock on this game one, two times maybe in the fourth quarter, but it wasn't even like a digital clock. So what they did was a, like the cameraman that's in Los Angeles at the game recorded the clock on the scoreboard. And they put the little graphic of that on the game. So, I mean, it was about as basic and old school as it gets. Like I said, we're just going to have to get used to it. So let's get right into this season, right? The 1972 National Football League season is the 53rd regular season of the NFL. So, I mean, we're looking. NFL's been going for quite some time and have only had seven Super Bowls in 53 seasons. It's Miami Dolphins, Washington Redskins in the Super Bowl. As we know, important to note. Miami Dolphins, they have scored the most points in the league and have allowed the fewest coming into this game. So let's see how they got here. But first, let's talk about some rule changes. Drew, we always like doing this, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, hockey, soccer, you name it. We will talk about the rule changes. And there were quite a few here in this season. And the first one blew my mind. This was the first season third down conversions were recorded as an official statistic. Why did it take so long? I don't understand why that wouldn't have been a statistic in the first place. Like, what are they thinking? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. I think I think that's an important aspect of football, you know? Like, the, the amount a team can convert on third down is really going to, like, it's going to reflect success, success for a team. And I'm really glad they started showing that now because, you know, as we know, that's a big stat today that many teams look at. And Washington was not very good on third down. We'll talk about it. I think there is one point where they were like two of seven, two of eight. I think I wrote it down, so I'm pretty sure we'll get to it. But next rule change, tie games, which were previously ignored with the winning percentage, were now made equal to a half game win and a half game loss. So it's good that ties aren't just ignored because why would you play a game for it to end in a tie and it not count towards anything? I like that rule now. It counts to a half game win and a half game loss. All fouls committed by the offensive team behind the line of scrimmage will be assessed from, from the previous spot. If a legal receiver goes out of bounds, either accidentally or forced out, and returns to catch or touch the ball in bounds, the penalty is a loss of down. So that's a big one, and that still goes on today, right? Yeah, illegal touching, I believe it's called. You can't run out so. and then come back in, catch the ball. Mostly we see that with like a punt return where one guy will try and like cheat code it and run around the outside and then get to the guy who's getting the ball. And they're like, uh-uh, nope, not how that's going to happen. And another thing here, I found this one interesting is our last rule change you'll talk about. Field numbers were standardized across the league. And this is for markings on the field, both in size and position. Prior to 1972, the Raiders field numbers were inside a silver shield and the Chargers used diamonds to mark numbers. The fields for the Oilers and Saints had field numbers closer to the sidelines than most stadiums. So now that it's standardized, that can't be it anymore. And I love this one right here. 
yard lines ending in five could not be marked. So you can't have five, 15, 25, 35. LSU does. And I absolutely love it. I mean, it's kind of a lot, but the Bills and Giants were the last teams to have markings for every five yards. Couldn't do that anymore in the rule changes. What are your thoughts? Do you like the five yard markings or do you just like a 10? Well, it really doesn't matter to me. I think it's cool to have all of them, you know, 5, 15, 25. Adam, I have them all, but NFL says no, you can't. Yeah, just got to go with what the NFL says. So, Drew, you have something for us to read. The uniform changes in the yeah. league. This is like we're on WOMT announcing the colors of the game, which you were very scared to do and wouldn't do. So uniform changes. What do you got for us? There's some interesting ones here. Yeah, first, I, I'm not a big colors of the game guy, but here we go. The Denver Broncos discontinued wearing orange pants with their white jerseys, as they did from 1968 to 1971. However, the orange pants returned in 1978 and 1979. And then the next one, the Detroit Lions, they added outlines to their to the jersey numbers. The Houston Oilers switched from silver to blue helmets. They also discontinued their silver pants in favor of white pants for their blue jerseys and blue pants for their white jerseys. These uniforms, however, only lasted three seasons. A lot of thought goes into these uniforms, and they change constantly. Yes, sir. I got one more. The Miami Dolphins reinstated their white jersey with alternating agua and orange stripes on the sleeves, which which was discontinued, discontinued when Don Shula became coach. So that was a few years back. And then, however, this style was not universally adopted, and several notable players, including Bob Greasy, and Larry Sanka continue to wear the 1970-1971 white jersey in plain sleeves. So that, that's, that's the uniform changes. And we have to include the last one in there for our Miami Dolphins, which are playing in the game today. Yeah, that's kind of wild that two players are just choosing what jerseys they want to wear and are going with the team. Bob Greasy, Larry Sanka, two big players we'll talk about yes. here in the game. But first, we got to see how we got there. Miami Dolphins, did you know, Drew? They played six preseason games. Six? Six preseason that's games. That's nuts. Considering that's, like now now three only. <laughs> yeah, they had, that's wow. cut in half. Six is way too much though. I mean, come on. Dolphins were three of three in the preseason. I just, that blew my mind to see they played six preseason games starting on August 5th. So, wow. Anyways, the Chiefs lost to the Dolphins 20 to 10. Dolphins beat the Oilers 34-13, beat the Vikings 16-14, beat the Jets 27-17, beat the Chargers 24-10, beat the Bills 24-23. Real close game there. Not close here as they beat the Colts 23-0, and they beat the Bills 30-16. Just absolutely walloped the Patriots 52-0, beat the Jets 28-24, beat the St. Louis Cardinals, no, not the baseball team, 31-10, Beat the Patriots again, 37-21. Beat the Giants, 23-13. And then shut off the Colts to end the year 16-0. So that's the Dolphins season. 14-0. Very important to note is they are undefeated going into the playoffs. As for the Redskins, they didn't finish the season too hot, but they started very beautifully. They beat the Vikings, 24-21. Beat the St. Louis Cardinals, 24-10. Lost to the Patriots by a point, 24-23. So they're now 2-1. But here, they go on a little win streak. Beat the Eagles 14-0. Beat the Cardinals again 33-3. Beat the Cowboys 24-20. Beat the Giants 23-16. Beat the Jets 35-17. Beat the Giants 27-13. Beat the Falcons 24-13. Beat the Packers 21-16. Beat the Eagles 23-7. And then they lost to the Cowboys 24-34. So a 10-point loss there. Then a seven-point loss to the Bills, 24-17. So on paper, Drew, 11-13 Redskins, 14-0 Dolphins. I want you to predict, how did the Packers do in this year, in the 1972 season? How do you think the Packers did? So as we know, or as I know, they were a playoff team this year. So I'm going to say they went in a 14-game season. They are probably like 10-4. Wow, nailed it. On the head, 10-4 exactly. Trivia. They Tied won it the, very very good. I mean, you could have cheated. The people don't know. You could have had the tab open at home, but I don't think you did. You're not that way. Packers won the NFC Central. They were 10-4. and four. Lions, Vikings, Bears underneath. NFC West was won by the 49ers. They were 8-5-1. and one. Falcons, Rams, Saints underneath. 
and the East was won by the Redskins. As we know, Cowboys were just one game back, 11-3 and and 10-4 and there. Dolphins not even close in the AFC East, 14-0. and Jets were 7-7 seven and seven in second place. And that is, so there was two divisions with five teams, and that was the Dolphins and Redskins. So both of those teams were in those five-team divisions. Everyone else had four. I find that intriguing. Steelers won a tight race in the AFC Central. They were 11-3. and three. Browns were 10-4. and four. And then the Raiders win the AFC West 10-3. and three. So, Drew, back to you here. Before we get to the playoffs, let's go over some awards real quick. We're going to read them all off besides the Super Bowl MVP, of course. Yeah, and I'm not going to be like Jordan, so I don't read the Super Bowl MVP. We don't spoil things here. Mm-mm. And I'm going to get started with – we're going to start right with the MVP. The most valuable player, Larry Brown running back of the Washington Redskins. We'll talk about him in the Super Bowl. Great player. Um, then we got for the coach of the year, Don Shula of the Miami Dolphins. Great coach. And he did a phenomenal game. We'll talk about that too. I mean, yeah, if your team goes undefeated yeah. in the regular season, you better win coach of the year. Offensive player of the year, Larry Brown, yet again. Defensive player of the year, Mean Joe Green, defensive tackle from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Offensive rookie of the year, Franco Harris, running back from Pittsburgh, defensive rookie of the year. Willie Buchanan, cornerback Green Green Bay, the Packers. Man of the year, Willie Lanier, linebacker from Kansas City. Comeback player of the year, Earl Morrill, quarterback of Miami. And Jordan, do you want to talk about Earl Morrill? So Earl Morrill, we barely, like, we barely heard about this guy in the game because obviously Greasy was the quarterback for the Dolphins, but they made a comment. That this he only played like a half before starting in the Super Bowl. And that is because Earl Morrill was the quarterback for this team. And then that was because of a greasy injury, right? Yes, that would be because of a greasy injury. And we saw him I don't start... remember how he got hurt, though. Like, do I'm you know not... the injury? I'm not sure. But all we know is that uh, Morrill ended up starting 11, 11 games that year. So he started a good chunk of games. And, like, it's just a shame. Like, I don't know, just. He he was a part of that that team, and you you hear more about Bob, you hear more about Greasy than um, Moral. Yeah, it's because of the effort from Greasy in the Super Bowl, which we'll talk about. But that could have been Moral's spot. I mean, it got taken from him as Greasy comes back from injury. I don't think they said it in the game either, unless they did early on, and we totally missed it. But yeah, that's that. Time for the Super Bowl. So getting into it, our announcers right out of the gate: Kurt Gowdy and Al Derogatis. Are the announcers in this game, Drew? Here we go. Same question every time. Turn the game on. It spoils the winner, by the way, in the title of this game. So coming in, we knew who won. But still, watching the game, turn it on right away. What are your first impressions? First thoughts. They zoom into the play-by-play. They zoom into Kurt Gowdy's face right away. And, I mean, we see the marching band first, which is very cool. But... We, we see Kurt Gowdy, they zoom into his face, and it's the weirdest thing ever, and I was not a fan of that. But my initial thoughts, hey, these guys are older. They know they, they know football, and that's great to hear an announcer who really knows the sport of football. So I thought they did a fine job. Yeah, I didn't really have a problem with it all. It felt like a radio broadcast again, and I guess that's just how it was in the old days as they presented it that way. Maybe it's just it's old school, and radio feels old school. I don't know, but we should mention Miami. They beat the Browns, the Steelers to make their way into the Super Bowl. The Redskins beat the Packers and the Cowboys. The Redskins only allowed six points getting into the Super Bowl. Three against Green Bay, three against Dallas. So that is very important to note as we get into the Super Bowl. 90,182 people in attendance. And did you think they were quiet? I mean, they didn't have a whole lot to cheer for, but I would not have known there was 90,000 people there. And I think part of that is because of the technology in the 70s. I don't know if they could really pick up the microphones and stuff, if that really picked up all the the uh, pandemonium in the arena or the, the stadium, but it's, it's possible they weren't that loud. Like, I mean, it didn't sound like it either, but I think part of it just is with the technology. Yeah, that's what I was also thinking as well. You're not really miking up the crowd, especially compared to what they do nowadays, and they aren't getting a lot of crowd shots either. I don't think there's like any at all, actually, but... We know the game is on NBC Sports. Interesting here. The winning players, did you catch this? They said the winning players get $15,000 and the losers get $7,500. I like that little incentive. 
And that's what the XFL did because I'm pretty sure if a team won, they got like a stipend of 50000 maybe or something a week. So there was a lot of incentive to win in the regular season. 86 degrees at kickoff, which is the second warmest uh. Super Bowl to date. That's a hot one. And we should mention the officials real quick before we get into the game. And they said the officials got paid $1,500 for this game and were chosen based on merit. So however you want to interpret that, but Drew, can you imagine being a Super Bowl official making $1,500 in today's day and age? Well, not in today's day and age for, f- for $1,500, but like, I mean, certainly in 1973, I, that's a pretty good gig if you ask me. Oh yeah, inflation. Certainly we bring that up nowadays. An estimated 75 million people were watching on television, and that was not the actual number. If I go down here, they said that the Nielsen rating was a 42.7, which is massive, and it was around 53.32 million viewers. So they really overestimated on the broadcast, but that's what you got to do, right? I mean, you got to tell the people everyone's watching, so you join as well, and let's get to it. There really was no pregame at all. I mean, they talked for like a 30 seconds, and then there was the coin toss, which the Dolphins win, and they choose to receive. So Dolphins get the ball, and then they go three and out. Right out of the gate, Redskins defense is proven up well. Redskins get the ball. They go to throw, get a first down off a screen, and then they're forced to punt. Miami gets the ball back. A huge sack early on leads to a fourth and 31. Dolphins are forced to punt, and then Redskins get the ball back. And they punt. So, Drew, I mean, punt, 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 punt to start this game. It had a really slow start. Oh, yeah, it did. And the reason, like Jordan and I, we mentioned right at the start, we called it like a high school kind of game. And the reason being that they're not high school level players. These guys are professionals. They were absolute studs. But, like, just the way the two coaches, their game plans, um, it was very high school-like based. It was run, first down, run, second down, pass, third down, punt, fourth down. And it was it was basically that, and it was a lot of screens and flares, not, nothing down the field. It was all this dink and dunk stuff, and it was it was just stuff you see in high, high school. Bob Creasy, he he threw some bullets later on in the game, but early on there really wasn't much until right here after the punt from the Redskins, a beautiful passing touchdown, and it is a seven nothing lead right out of the way. That was Howard Twiley, a twenty eight yard reception. From Greasy, extra point is good. Boy, oh boy, do kickers come into a factor later on in the game. But it's a 7 nothing lead for the Dolphins at this point. I think there's only a few seconds left. First quarter's over. Took 27 minutes, so really not too long at all. And now we go into the second quarter right out of the gate. Redskins get the ball and an interception. I think it's basically at this point when I kind of realize Billy Clymer, He's not a good quarterback at all. No, and he, he's an old guy. He's, he was a 33-year-old vet. Um, he, you could tell that he, he got to this game because of guys like the MVP, Larry Brown, and that phenomenal Redskins defense. That, that's basically what got him into this game. And, yeah, it was definitely not the quarterback who got the Redskins team. Not even close. And dare I say the quarterback maybe costed him the game? I don't know. We're going oh, yeah, to see. Oh, yeah, for sure. We're going to have to see down the stretch as what happens with him, but it, it's really just not good at all. Even in my next note, after Miami, three and out punt. Then again, I put Climber's not good at throwing because besides screen passes, I mean, he couldn't really do anything at all. And then we go back to the one and only Bob Greasy throws an absolute dime for a touchdown, but there was an illegal procedure called against Miami ultimately. They have to punt. Was it just me or was it kind of hard to tell penalties in this game? Like there was one obvious full start, but otherwise I couldn't really tell what was going on penalty wise. No. And back, back then, like this is like we have mentioned 1973, there's not really that communication we see between the, um, the sports broadcast and like the officials where they have the microphones. It was awfully hard to tell like what was going on. I mean, you could see the hand signals, like you could see like the holding call or like, and like what, what side, but other than that, it was kind of tough. Yeah, I would have to agree there. And it's not like the announcers didn't know what they were calling or anything. Certainly they knew what was going on, but that is a big thing how the referees don't have like the little mic pack where they can talk to the whole crowd and spread the message. So Redskins ball, once again, off the punt. They've got a lengthy drive, which they have a few of them in the second half, but this lengthy drive 
results in another interception. Jake Scott comes up with a big interception, and he has one more in this game. He ends up with two interceptions. Miami quarterback drops back, hits a beautiful dime, and from about the one-yard line, they get themselves a rushing touchdown. Jim Heek gets the ball into the end zone. It is 14-0. Miami leads. Redskins get a play or two off, and then it is halftime. So on our version of the game, they went right back into the game. It was like commercial, boom, second half, done. We're here, ready to go. There was, I think there was something about a halftime show in this note I have on Wikipedia. Let's see. The halftime show featuring Woody Herman and the Michigan marching band along with the citrus college singers and andy williams was titled happiness is so i guess they titled the halftime show back at this day and age but we didn't get to see any of that and drew miami leads 14 nothing at the half what are your thoughts at this point washington hasn't done a whole lot at all so i think with billy kilmer i think with his his poor performance i think that played a part but what what really stood out to me was that no name Miami Dolphin defense, and I'm just going to give a little history lesson here, Jordan. The reason they're called the no-name defense is it was something that coach of the Cowboys, Tom Landry, gave the Dolphins. He, he commented about their defense, and he mentioned that that their defense, that they were no, they had a bunch of no-names on it, and that really, like, offended, I guess, the Miami Dolphins, and they, they kind of use that as motivation is what it sounds like. So when they have – and they, they did a great job. They shut down Larry Brown. He was he had nothing going for him in the first half. And guys like Manny for, Manny Fernandez and Bill Stanfield, just guys like that, they, they just really stepped up. Jake Scott, we mentioned, who had some intercept, who had an air, a couple of interceptions. Just they, they played great. Great job for this defense. And let's mention real quick, too. I mean, obviously the defense did a fantastic job. But one other thing that stood out to me, these helmets, right? So the, all the helmets were different. Obviously, we know what an old helmet looks like, but I didn't realize there were this many versions. So like one quarterback would have a helmet with just like one little strap in front of his mouth area here. Some of them would have it where the straps like down their helmet and then they had other bars going up. Some had like two straps. What did you think of these? These things were all over the place. And how do they decide? Like, do the players get to pick what one they want or customize their own? I don't get it. Yeah, I wasn't sure how the NFL distinguishes or the teams allow like certain what, what helmets. But they, they look like kind of pieces of crap, not going to lie, compared oh, yeah. to the helmets. Oh, compared to the helmets we have today. I mean, it's just night and day. But I, that's what they had back then. And they might have been comfier. Who knows? They didn't look comfier, to say the least. But No, they honestly looked like plastic. I mean, you just put your helmet on and then a little bar in front. They didn't have a visor. They didn't have a little chin strap or anything like that. Minimal protection at all. But let's get to the second half. There, I think there was an injury in this game later on. So, I mean, we know old school football. It, it was rough. But... Redskins, speaking of rough, they get to the red zone on the first drive because, uh, as we know, Miami won the coin toss, decided to get the ball in the first half. Redskins get it here. They get it all the way down. Then they just miss a field goal so terribly. Drew, this thing wasn't even close. It was about as far right as you can get. Yeah, for a 25-yard uh, chip shot, that was kind of kind of uh, disappointing for this Redskins offense who needed to get something going. They got it going. They had a good drive. Coach George Allen was... I watched his halftime speech on YouTube. He he had a great speech about character. These last 30 minutes are going to make up this game, and it's our 30 minutes to control it. And he, his team did what he they did what he told them to do. And just to see them miss that field goal was just like, oh, such a bummer. Very deflating for the team. And I mean, sure, 14-3, still a two possession game, but at least you would have got some momentum. You would have got points on the board. Dolphins punt right out of the gate. And at this point, I say that the one and only Bill Clemmer is doing absolutely terrible and he's missing everything if it's not a screen. And just to prove that he's basically only throwing screens, he's 10 of 18 with 84 yards at this point in the game. So not big numbers at all. He misses three longer passes leading to a punt. He's just, and it's kind of crazy to say this, he's overthrowing his receivers. So like he has an arm, they're just not getting into the hands at all. And at this point, it became the Larry Sanka show. This dude is a monster. He was a big boy at that. He's listed as a fullback, actually. He had a 50-yard run, which is the longest run the Redskins have allowed all year. And they showed the replay of this three times from three different angles. I mean, 
Drew, they loved this run from Larry Sanka. Well, it was a great run. And like that offensive line for the Dolphins, let me tell you, that was something else. They this team was so balanced. They had everything. They had a, they had an offensive line, a defensive line, a linebackers, like they a great quarterback. Um it, it was just it was great. It was just a great team to watch play football. Larry Sanka led the way in rushing yards, and I do have to say real quick, so there was a guy, not the football player, but there was someone else named Larry Sanka who wrote, like, articles on a website and stuff. He was, like, one of my favorite to always go to read all about what this guy had to say. I mean, he wrote on a very consistent basis. It was his full-time job. And then eventually stuff just happened. His health went downhill. He actually had his leg amputated, and all of a sudden, one morning, I woke up. I was on Twitter, and I saw he passed away. And, I mean, that, it was very sad stuff. He wasn't old at all. He had three girls at home, three little kids, and it is very, very sad for him. Not the football player, but another Larry Sanka. I mean, terrible stuff there. But back to the game in my notes. They brought out the chains for a play later on, and it was a full yard short. I don't know what they were thinking. This thing wasn't even close. True. Like, any person could tell this wasn't a first down. Oh yeah, it was obvious. I'm sure. I'm sure uh, George George Allen wanted to see. He's like, or both coaches they wanted to, you know see what it was going on with the chains. So that's kind of what happened there. But it was like, that's why it was just a needless. It just filled up time. Yeah, and they did it later in the game too. I had it in my notes where this one was like a full yard, easily a first down, and they brought the chain out once again. Don't understand it, and then. The first pass attempt of the drive. We're still on the Dolphins, by the way. They're still moving down the field after that big run. First pass of the drive, intercepted. So this was deep in the end zone. Redskins forced their first turnover of the game off, honestly, not a terrible pass from Bob Greasy. Just kind of underthrow, underthrew his receiver a little bit. Redskins ball coming into the fourth quarter. Drew, they're down 14 nothing. And they have more first downs at this point than the Dolphins. 15 to 10. They lead the first down battle. I yelled in all caps that finally they showed the clock for the first time. This was with about eight minutes left. And another good Redskins drive. They're moving down the field, eating up time, which isn't the best thing. But here, I, <laughs> Billy Clymer throws the ball. Off the goalpost. The goalposts are in the middle of the end zone. And he was trying to hit a receiver back in the end zone. And he hit the goalpost. Like, why are the goalposts here? Yeah, that was interesting. And that kind of that kind of threw him off. I mean, he was having a good game to begin with. And just when stuff isn't going your way, it kind of just avalanche for Billy Kleiner. Kil- I, Kilmer. Yeah, yeah I, I just... It blew my mind earlier in the game when I saw the goalposts were so far in. It doesn't really make sense, but it cost him here. And then, as I said, he hit the goalpost and then throws an interception the next place. Like you said, it got to him. I mean, it was a mental game at this point. Almost a huge return for the Dolphins, but they only get 50 yards. Only get 50 yards as they're back at midfield. There's about five minutes to go. And Miami throws the ball on third down so I don't really understand what they were doing here but they threw it and then everything gets a little crazy field goal attempt from the Dolphins Drew would you like to explain what happened on this field goal here we go we have Hall of Fame kicker Garo Yepremian he is getting ready to kick one of the biggest field goals of his life here it is he gets the snap is good the hold's great (laughs) or the um, the issue is the kick. He kind of, yeah, it doesn't really happen. There's no kick. No. Nope. He um, gets the, then he has the ball because then what has to, what happens is. That ball is, just went rolling yeah, around for a bit that, and all of that, a sudden it ended up in his hands somehow. Yeah, it, it just ended up in his hands. And then what happened was he got the ball. Uh, he tried to throw the ball. He tried to be the hero, <laughs> hero of the game, get a touchdown. And he, he loses the ball while it's in his, like, he loses it while he tries to throw it. Nobody touches him. And then he bats the ball around after he loses it. And then the other team, the Redskins, they scoop it up and they run it back for a touchdown. So it happened with a, it, the ball just, like, after the snap, I don't know how to explain it. The ball kind of just, like, ended up on the, on the field. Like, it was a yeah, no I man's land. I don't know what happened with it at all. Like, they got it back and then all of a sudden it ended up, and instead of just laying on the ball, like you told me before we went on, this dude tries to throw it in the most unathletic play I've ever seen. Like it 
slips back behind his arm, bounces off him. It's going all around. I mean, you have yeah. to see it. I'm sure if you type in Super Bowl seven missed field goal, I'm sure it'll come up oh. right away. Yeah, and this play, fun fact, Jordan, it is a, it is number 10 on the worst NFL plays of all time. He is made it the really? list. It's I didn't number know, 10. I didn't fact. even know there was a list. That's there is actually a list. Kind of, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> At this oh. point, right? The the Redskins, they kind of have all the momentum. I mean, they just had a good drive, all resulted in the interception on the last play, but Dolphins now, they just completely blow that field goal. They're up 14-7 still. Two minutes and seven seconds left. Dolphins ball, and for whatever reason, one of the running backs decides to run out of bounds with a minute 45 to go after a first down. I don't know why at all. It doesn't make sense. But then Redskins defense really shows up. They use all three timeouts. They get the ball back with about a minute 20 to go. So Redskins down seven, 80 seconds left on the clock. Here we go. Final drive of the game. The the announcer, Kurt Gowdy, he said, he said that Billy Clymer threw this first pass out of bounds on purpose. Drew, do you think so? I don't think he did. I think he just missed. No way. Like, he, he's been off the whole game. He finished with a 19.6 QBR. And oh my I think a guy who was had 14 completions for 104 yards, I, I really, you know, three interceptions as we'll go, we'll put that in as well. I think a guy who was having a horrific performance, like a historically bad performance. I don't think there's any way he tried to throw that out of bounds. I no, just, I, yeah. He just missed that bad. I mean, an answer tried to cover for him. Good for him. But then on the second play, almost throws an interception. Like, it was that close to throwing an interception on the second play. So the drive is going terribly so far. And then what do we do on third down and 10 with about a minute left? No timeouts. Let's throw a screen pass. And they lose four yards on this screen pass. So there's... 40 seconds left, clock's ticking down, fourth down. What happens? He gets sacked. The no-name defense comes up big, and that sack seals the deal. A 14-7 win for the Miami Dolphins. And after the game, this field was a mess. This was very similar to Lakers-Pistons, where they all stormed the court. Everyone stormed the field. I don't know who all came down on the field. It certainly wasn't just friends and family. I mean, this field drew afterwards. A complete mess, a disaster. Oh, yes, it was, Jordan. And I just want to shout out Don, Don Chula for this game because, as we know, the year before, his team, the Dolphins, they lost 24 to 3 in Super Bowl 6. And right now, he's this coach who's been able to win all these regular season's games, but he has no Super Bowl yet. And that's kind of, from what I've read, it sounds like that was kind of like, like haunting him from like other people were saying, like, because he was such a great coach, he wins all these, like the head coach of the, like the coach of the year awards. And he was just missing that 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 ring, and just for him in Super Bowl seven to like pr- prove the haters wrong and have that perfect season, that seventeen and zero season, I think that was just great to see. And I think I think Don Shula deserves it. He really did. He did undoubtedly. This was only the Dolphins' seventh season as a team, and like you said, they were in the Super Bowl back to back years. A hideous performance in Super Bowl six, but Super Bowl seven, they get the job done. And now, Drew, are you ready to read? Who was our Super Bowl most valuable player? I can tell you right now, it wasn't Billy Clymer. Yes, I'm ready to read it. It was Jake Scott, the safety from the Miami Dolphins. And we've mentioned his name already multiple times. He had two interceptions, and he was a part of that no-name defense that Tom Landry better give a name to now because to these guys because these guys, like, they were they were all good, they're good players. They are all they were also good fundamentally, and they just made some great decisions. They were smart players. They were aggressive. They really shut down Larry Allen, and it was just great to see. Just some a few more stats here before we go off here, as they say. Jake Scott, let's mention him one more time. He had 63 return yards in this game off those two interceptions. One was the big 55-yard return, which could have been a touchdown if it wasn't for the Redskins stopping him. Scott became the second defensive player in Super Bowl history to earn an MVP award. The last one, Super Bowl V. Chuck Howley got it in Super Bowl V. We will not be watching Super Bowl V or Super Bowl VI. We'll be watching Super Bowl III later on. And if you aren't following the Instagram, Jordan Drew underscore sports crew, we released the full schedule for our summer sports spectacular. You guys got us to 50 followers. Everything is up. 
I made a nice little calendar graphic about as easy as you can make, super easy to read. It's all up there on the Instagram. And last thing before we end up our Super Bowl seven talk, this was the second lowest scoring Super Bowl to date with only 21 points scored in the game. Second to only the 13 to three score of Super Bowl 53 in 2018. So that's that. Dolphins finish with a perfect undefeated season. Anything else to add for this game, Drew? No, we talked about it all. The 17-0 Dolphins, they completed the perfect season. And we saw the Patriots try to do that in 07. Didn't happen. 16-1. and one, Or it was it was because they had more games. They had yeah, one I think loss. 18 yeah. or yeah, something, something like, like that. that. But yeah, it was great, great Super Bowl. Other than, like, I mean, first half, a little boring. Second half picked up. Fourth quarter when the when the infamous um, uh, kick kicker trying to throw a pass play happened. That kind of made it all worth it. Yeah, it really did. I think that this fourth quarter of the game really just made this game a good good watch, and I recommend watching it if you have not. It's not a it's like an hour fifty one minutes too, not so bad. it's like real real easy to sit through if you got two hours on a night all of a sudden and you want to watch a game. So. Speaking of games, next week, what are we doing? Everyone wants to know. If you aren't following the Instagram, you won't know. But I can tell you right here next week, we will be watching the 1984 NCAA Basketball Championship game. Drew, do you have any idea what we're in for next week? Patrick Ewing. I think that's Georgetown. If, if I'm not mistaken, I think George, that's Georgetown playing, some, playing a game. Ooh, I, you might be right. It might be North Carolina and Georgetown. That, that rings a bell. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be that game. I'm not positive. Don't quote me on that. We might be wrong, but that's my, what it actually... Oh, no, I'm wrong. I actually wrote it down. It's Georgetown and Houston in the game next week. So oh, Houston... Is Hakeem on that team? Is it is, is Hakeem? For, I'm playing for, I mean, I know he played for the Rockets, but I think he played for Houston for college, too, if I'm not it, mistaken. It could that be. That might be a good game. I think it'll certainly be a good game. Our first taste of college basketball here on the podcast and like i said we got our instagram which you can follow we got our apple podcast follow us leave a five star rating on there youtube follow us on there subscribe to us on there as well and that pass that basically wraps it up drew you got anything else to plug before we get out of here you can follow me on instagram drew skyberg d-r-e-w-s-k-y-b-e-r-g beautiful job and if you haven't listened to episode 15 of our podcast, please go ahead and do it. We talk a lot of stuff on there, including some high school things as well. So we really added to our repertoire, going back to our roots, talking about some big old high school things that happened. And that's basically it. Jordan Law underscore PXP on Twitter. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back right, right next week. I couldn't, my words just messed up at the end, but we'll be back next week. Thank you all for listening to Jordan and Drew, the sports crew, the perfect podcast for you.